The elders of the Pruitt and Lobe congregation welcome you to this series of lectures on the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship. It is our hope and prayer that the lessons these five men bring will be edifying and upbuilding to the flock over which the Lord has charged our responsibility. As did Cornelius, we have encouraged the members of this congregation to invite friends and relatives from far and near to come and learn from this series of lessons from God's Word. As the morals of society around us have declined, it has had an effect on the Lord's Church. In many places, clear and pointed preaching has given way to soft teaching and preaching that neglects specific application to sins of the individual Christian. The result is an increasing moral looseness among God's people which has not been seen in past generations. It is our intent that the sermons presented will show the clear and unmistakable difference between the entirety of what the Bible says and the unbalanced practice of avoiding things of a negative nature. The men participating in this lectureship have been encouraged to make plain and pointed applications but avoid that which might be construed as personal attacks towards men or congregations. Please compare the things presented with what you read in the Bible so each one may benefit from this lectureship. And now speaking to you, Tom Roberts on Romans 14, Recognizing God's Children. <laughs> it's a great joy to be here with you this evening. To be a part of the singing is a great blessing. And to be able to be a part of this assembly is a great blessing. I appreciate those of you who've come from far and near to be a part of this and we pray that everything is done is done to the glory of God and that God will bless us in our efforts. We appreciate you for your interest. We trust that you have your Bibles present. And because we're going to be speaking a great deal this week on the, the 14th chapter of the book of Romans, I'm going to be asking each of you, if you would, to spend a great deal of time in reading that as this week progresses. I'd like for you to read that again and again. Let those verses sink deep in your heart so that when some of those principles are being discussed that you'll be able to be familiar with those and know what we're talking about. I want to begin, of course, by expressing appreciation to the elders for this church by inviting us to speak on this subject. I believe they show courage and wisdom in having done this and prepared this. And I trust that you will receive the messages that are being brought and the way they're being delivered from honest hearts with a desire to please God and to glorify His name. I appreciate those who've come from far and near to be here this evening. Look forward to our studies together and I'm looking forward to my part being ended when I can then relax and listen to the other speakers and what they have to say. I want to begin with a few disclaimers. I want you to understand very clearly that I am not now nor have I ever been nor do I intend ever to be a part of a party other than simply a Christian. I know that when we deal with issues sometimes that are divisive or sometimes that are controversial, and sometimes there are those who say, well, you're just lining up with the group. You're lining up with the party. And of course, to some degree, that's judging motives and hearts. If I know in my own heart, I want to be right with God, whether I'm right with anyone else on the face of the earth. I do not subscribe to partyism, but I believe that we ought to be a part of God's people to stand up and be counted when the time is necessary. And I believe that that's one of these times. I got another disclaimer it has to do with the issue we'll be discussing and that there are those whom I love very dearly and respect in many ways who are teaching things with which I disagree. I hold no animosity toward anyone. There is an issue involved that is divisive that I think will cause people to lose their souls. When I address this subject this evening, though I'm going to be speaking of some who disagree with me, I want you to understand that I love them dearly and that I respect them and that I hold no animosity, but that I'm addressing an issue that needs to be addressed. We need to understand clearly that those things are so because otherwise there might be some judging of motives that would cause the issue to be clouded. 
I would like you to truly understand what we're about this evening. Now I want to begin with the lesson itself by talking about the fact the Bible says that we serve a holy God. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5 that God is light, in Him is no darkness at all. Thus that speaks with regard to God's character and that He is absolutely righteous. He is holy. Furthermore, it said in the Scriptures that we are to be holy as He is holy. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. We understand, therefore, that God calls us into fellowship with Him, and if we're going to be in fellowship with God, we must be a holy people. There are things that are true in the world, and more and more being true in the church, where they would lead us away from that holy life that we have to live with our God, and that would interfere with the fellowship that we enjoy. And as we discuss those things, we're going to be talking about fellowship, but the important thing to recognize is that I must be right with God because He's holy. As we look at the first chart, we're going to be talking about, to some degree, fellowship. And the proverb writer said, Do not remove the ancient landmark which our fathers have said. And we're taking that from the standpoint in our study tonight that God has set through the apostles. There are landmarks that God has set that we must not remove. And as we understand, those landmarks are there. Those landmarks are there for the purpose that we may enjoy the fellowship with God. John said in 1 John 1 verse 3, That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We need to understand that fellowship is the most precious thing that we can have in our relationship with God. As we look at the next chart, we're going to be talking about basically... The fact that things have changed in man's life over a period of centuries. In the beginning, of course, in the Garden of Eden, we had wonderful fellowship with God. Adam and Eve did, and the Genesis record shows that when God made man, God made him upright, and they enjoyed a fellowship together. But sadly, sin entered the picture, and that fellowship was broken. Isaiah cried in chapter 59, Your sins and iniquities have separated between you and your God. Thus the fellowship was broken. And the condition without fellowship is certainly seen in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 where the Apostle Paul speaks at length with regard to the conditions that came upon mankind because we had gone away from God. And as we gave up the knowledge of God, God gave man up to a reprobate mind. That's in chapter 1. And then in chapter 2 he lamented the fact that the Jews who had the law were not even better than the Gentiles because they did the same things even knowing what the law said. The end result was what Paul finally cried in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Quite clearly, the Apostle Paul felt the practice of sin in his own life, as chapter 7 talks about, and recognized the condition that sin brought. Brethren and friends, all we have to do tonight is look about us at the world to recognize the condition of sin. And our great desire tonight ought to be a return to the fellowship that we have with Jesus Christ. In the book of Romans and other places of the Bible, we learn that what we lost in Eden, we regained in Christ. That is, the tree of life has been regained and will be regained in heaven that we lost in the Garden of Eden. Brother Odie wrote a book many years ago, The Tree of Life Lost and Regained, that carries with it this idea that man has lost the fellowship with God and the life that comes from that fellowship to be finally regained in heaven. And in Christ Jesus, we have that fellowship restored. The next chart shows that fellowship with God is conditional. It is not, as the sectarians and the Calvinists say, unconditional, but rather conditional. And it's based upon God's character. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5 again, God is light, in Him is no darkness at all. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, we're called out of darkness into light. We need to recognize there, first of all, that whatever fellowship we have with God is based upon His character. What that says clearly is that if I'm to have fellowship with God, God is not going to come down to my level, but I must bring myself up to God's level through the grace that's extended through faith. We clearly understand that I must have fellowship with the Holy God. I cannot be involved in a practice, an ongoing practice of sin, and be right with God. Fellowship with God will be broken. Because God is a holy God and He will not countenance, He will not fellowship evil. I need to clearly understand that. So then my obedience to some degree is going to have a determination on my fellowship with God. 
In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, we're urged to walk as children of light. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 says that we are to walk in the light. Therefore, that we may become, John 12, sons of light. And Philippians 2 verse 15, we shine as lights in the world. That's a good sermon in itself. That alone could give us an understanding of what God wants us to be and to practice in our walk with the Lord, to recognize that we are to be children of light. And whatever reasoning, however it may come about, that someone would suggest that it's possible for me to walk in darkness and yet maintain my fellowship with God goes against the very character of God Himself. Thou art of holy eyes, thou art of pure eyes, than to behold evil. Therefore, God is not going to receive me of the fellowship with Himself if I engage in sinful practices. In the next chart, we understand what walking in the light means as John describes it. I'm going to summarize this by saying the walking and what the apostles declared. John says, we have seen, we have handled, we have touched the Word of life, Jesus Christ. And what we have seen, we declare to you that you may have this fellowship. Walking in the light is equal in the, John's writing to keeping the commandments. Walking in the light is equal to abiding in what you have been taught. Walking in the light is equal to hearing what the apostles taught and abiding in that. It is equal to what 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, of walking in the gospel because there are those whom the God of this world has blinded their eyes that they might not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we talk about walking in the light, it is not simply a sentiment. It is not an attitude of heart. It is rather the way of life that we follow by walking in that light. Fellowship is, designed, is defined in the Bible very clearly. It's not a difficult term to understand. The Bible describes it and we can understand it. It comes from a word which means communion, our fellowship, our sharing in common. And is used, <coughs> pardon me, beginning in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, in the beginning of the church. And continues throughout the Bible, 1 John chapter 3 again. John writes and declares that you may have fellowship. Is also described as a partnership in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. And we may have fellowship in works of darkness that we cannot have fellowship with God, but it would still be a sharing in these things. It is also described by another word that's used as an adjective with regard to being a fellow in something. Here this would be connected to being a fellow citizen or a fellow disciple or a fellow servant, a soldier or a fellow worker. And this suggests that in fellowship we share some things together. When we understand that, we need to be very clear that we approach this with the understanding that what we have fellowship in is going to determine our fellowship with God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, I'd like to have you please turn with me in your Bibles to that. I'd like to feel you have time to take notes and to study in the Bible with you as we turn to the passages. In 2 Corinthians 6, beginning of verse 14, the Apostle Paul warns us what we're not to have fellowship in. But by reversing the process of looking about what we're not to have fellowship in, we're able to understand those things in which we may have fellowship and what it means to us. In verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them, and do and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Quite clearly what is being said there is that as we understand and come out from the darkness, we enter into a relationship with God that is called a yoking. I remember the difficulty I had in the beginning of my Bible study with the idea of yoking. When Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, I had trouble with that because I thought it meant that becoming a Christian was a heavy burden to bear. I was glad when I finally learned what that passage means and what a blessing it is. You understand with a yoke that you share a burden. Rather than have one beast of burden do a lot of work together, if you put them in a yoke, the work is cut in two. And thus in a yoke there is a sharing of the labor. And what is said with regard to being in the yoke with Jesus Christ is that Jesus yokes himself with us, <coughs> or we yoke ourselves with him, <coughs> and therefore the labors that we are to be in are shared. 
We have a communion with Christ. We have concord with Him in fellowship. We have a portion in the Spirit with Jesus Christ. We live in agreement because we follow the teaching of Jesus Christ of the Apostles. We dwell together. We walk together. And by that we are therefore being received and receive one another and belong to the family of God. I can think of no passage that shows fellowship and what it means more clearly than these things. And all of this is involved in fellowship if by some stretch of the imagination it can be said that we can have fellowship in some sinful practice. What it means is that not only are we saying that we can have fellowship in these areas with sinful practices, but that we would involve God in those sinful practices. And what we've learned from 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3 and verse 5 and other passages is that God will not be yoked together with those things. We need to clearly understand that that's the case. The next chart shows that the fellowship is both vertical and horizontal. Those are the terms that are used, I believe, accommodatively as we understand the yoking that we have together. Fellowship is vertical in the sense that it's between God and man. John writes, 1 John chapter 1, that you may have fellowship with God through us. And as we have that fellowship, it is a sharing and communion with God and ourselves as individual Christians. But also horizontal between brethren in Christ. And as we walk in the light, as He is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sin and we have that fellowship one with another. I believe that's talking about the fellowship we have together as brethren. There are some ramifications to this when we recognize, first of all, that God is not going to receive me in fellowship with Him if I've involved in something sinful. I may be involved in sinful practices with my brethren, and God will remove His fellowship from me. At the same time, I may be in fellowship with God and recognize that those who are my brethren will not have fellowship with me in those things that I'm practicing with God. And there, we need to understand that that's the truth, but the next chart shows that God is the one who controls fellowship. The local church does not control fellowship, and I do not control fellowship. God does. God controls fellowship and the church universal between God and between individual saints. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, when those individuals obeyed the gospel and gladly received the word and were baptized, the Lord added together daily those that were being saved. Thus, God is the one who in, in, endorses and maintains that fellowship. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, when we're baptized into Christ, we put on Christ, and we're part of Christ in that fellowship. 1 John 1 and verse 5 again speaks of the fellowship we have that's in Christ Jesus. And Hebrews 12 and verse 23 speaks of that fellowship as being in the general assembly. Thus talking about the church universal. And we have as individual Christians, the members of the body of Christ, we have a fellowship with the Lord that God determines. At the same time, there is fellowship in the local church that also is controlled by God. I'm hearing some remarks today by brethren that seems to indicate that the local church can decide whether or not we practice evil things or things contrary to the doctrine of Christ. And the local church is going to make a decision about those things. I recognize in some degrees it may be true that a church may decide to do things unscriptural and they'll have fellowship in that. But we need to understand that though a church may decide to do that, they cannot maintain that fellowship with God as a congregation while they're doing that. A local church, brethren, never is the arbiter of truth. The church of Jesus Christ does not decide what truth is. God does, and God controls the fellowship. And if a church decides that we're going to go along with divorce and remarriage, we're going to receive adulterers into the fellowship, you may decide to do that. That may be your decision. But you need to recognize that God is going to control the fellowship and in the book of Revelation, clearly Jesus warned that some of the churches were going to have its candlestick removed because they were not walking in the light. So as the church applies the doctrine of Jesus Christ, Christ is controlling the local fellowship as well as the fellowship in the church universal. In Acts chapter 9, beginning of verse 26, the uh, apostle Paul, then known as Saul, as said to join himself to the disciples at Jerusalem, and they would not do so. They recognized they had a responsibility to be right with God, and they thought that Paul was still a blasphemer. When finally they were convinced that Paul had been converted, they accepted him into their fellowship. And in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9, they were said to have received him with the right hand of fellowship in discussing the matters of the book of Galatians. 
3 John 9 speaks of Diotrephes, who would throw some out of the church, who would receive the writings of the Apostle John. And though there's a congregation that may decide, I'm not going to have fellowship with those who are faithful, God still controls the fellowship between Him and the individuals, and God controls the fellowship in the local church. Looking then at that fellowship, we want to note in the next chart that there are some human concepts of fellowship that would remove these ancient landmarks and that become a Trojan horse that would bring sin into the church. Many, many centuries ago, somewhere about 1100 B.C., there was a city named Troy that was besieged by the Greeks for ten years. And after ten years, they could not take the city by force. Finally, after ten years of besieging the city of Troy, the Greeks built a huge hollow wooden horse and concealed in the belly of that beast some soldiers. And then they departed as though they were leaving the city and breaking the siege. Those in Troy brought the wooden horse into the gates of the city not knowing what was in the horse. Of course, the end result was that after darkness fell, the Greek soldiers came out of the horse and what they could not do by force, they did by subterfuge and the city of Troy fell. Forevermore, the Trojan horse has been the symbol of hidden design and of bringing things inside that we might not understand. We need to be very careful that today in the church there are those who are using Romans chapter 14 as a Trojan horse. There are those who are trying to put into Romans chapter 14 a lot of things that will result in those accepting Romans 14 and bringing that into the fellowship of the church and to the preaching and the practice of the churches, those things that would sever the fellowship with God. When we look at the next chart, we're going to be talking about unity and diversity. Unity and diversity that is old as the Bible itself. Go back now in your minds to 1 John chapter 1 again where you had those that were called the Gnostics. Those who were the superior elite. Those who believed they knew more than the apostles knew about truth. They believed they had some kind of a mystical idea about truth by which they could practice sinful things and still remain Christians. And you notice in the Gospel of John or the Epistle of John that's exactly what's being taught. They said in 1 John chapter 1, we can walk in darkness and say we have no sin. Well, that's a marvelous thing if it would be true, but it's simply not true. Note again that we serve a holy God. God is not going to be in fellowship with sin. When the Gnostics said that we may walk in darkness and say that we have no sin, John says they were liars. There's no truth in them. They could deny the deity of Jesus and yet at the same time claim to be children of God. They would claim to love God, chapter 4, verse 20, but they failed to keep the commandments. Brethren, this establishes, first of all, the idea of the unity and diversity. The idea we can enjoy sinful practices. We can engage in things that are wrong. We can practice darkness. And yet hold on to our faith in Christ, hold on to being a Christian. Everything that we've said to here shows that's not true. If you understand the character of God, Surely you must understand that God is not going to allow the body of Christ to be filled with error. God controls fellowship. I may bring sinful practices into my life, but I will lose my fellowship with God. If we bring sinful practices and sinful doctrines into the body of Christ, the church, we will lose our fellowship with God as well. In John's day, when they were opposed, they went out from them Today, people are saying, we don't want to go out. We want to stay in the church. We want to bring our sinful practices in the church. Another illustration of the unity and diversity is the next chart that deals with denominations and how denominations have practiced unity and diversity. This is a statement by Sam Morris, who was a Baptist preacher in Stanford, Texas. It's quite famous in what he said. Here's how he was going to bring sin into the church as so far as he was concerned. We take the position that a Christian's sins do not damn his soul. The way a Christian lives, what he says, his character, his conduct, or his attitude toward other people have nothing to do with the salvation of his soul. All the prayers a man may pray, all the Bibles he may read, all the churches he may belong to, all the services he may attend, all the sermons he may practice, all the debts he may pay, 
All the ordinances he may observe, all the laws he may keep, all the benevolent acts he may perform will not make his soul one whit safer, and all the sins he may commit from idolatry to murder will not make his soul in any more danger. The way a man lives has nothing whatever to do with the salvation of his soul. Surely you understand the sinfulness of that concept. That is as rank heresy as possibly can be. It is reminiscent of the Gnostic heresy that says that we can practice sinful things and still be right with God. The next chart shows that the history of this is continuing and that people more close to home in our tone generations believe and practice the same thing. C.H. Dodd in his Church of England affiliation says that in the earliest church a distinct activity called preaching was practiced. Teaching is a second distinct activity of the early church. The practice and content of teaching are the product of the evolutionary development of the earliest church as it awaited the second coming of Jesus. Now what he meant by that and the application of it was that there are two things. One is gospel, the other is doctrine. Our salvation is brought by gospel and he was very restrictive in what he believed the definition of gospel was. He restricted it to seven items. And then he said doctrine has nothing at all to do with our salvation. So long as you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you may practice or believe anything doctrinally that you wish, and you're still going to be in the fellowship. That has been widely disseminated among religious people, and what C.H. Dodd has taught has been brought into a number of people who we might recognize their names in the Church of Christ. The next chart shows one of them. Many of you might be familiar with the name Carl Ketcherside. Carl Ketcherside was considered a radical among brethren for many years. He began, however, to pick up, and I don't know particularly how he formed the association with Dodd's doctrine, but, see, but Carl Ketcherside began to teach and practice the same thing. He said, I regard every sincere, contrite person on the face of the earth who believes in Jesus as the Son of God, as God's child in prospect. He is God's child because he's been begotten of my Father, but has not been born into the family relationship. Ketcherside's application of that was that you may have fellowship with all those who call upon God, who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God regardless of what they practice doctrinally. He said in the next chart to go further with this, to show how far his doctrine finally took him, no honest opinion held by one who is in Christ Jesus and who respects his lordship is another gospel. Since it is the gospel which forms the basis of fellowship with the Father, the Son, and one another in Christ, such an opinion can never be made a test of union or communion in Christ. A man may hold a view as to the perseverance of the saints, the manner of the resurrection or the second coming of our Lord, and he may prove to be as wrong as one could be, but he cannot be debarred from citizenry in the kingdom of heaven by other subjects. So, according to him, you could be a premillennial. You could believe in once saved, always saved. You could believe in all these various doctrines and still be right with God. And here's a man who claimed to be a member of the church. Yet he was accepting the end result of the gospel doctrine distinction so that people were being involved in his fellowship that were not in fellowship with God. He had a cohort in this named Leroy Garrett. The next chart shows clearly Leroy Garrett believed the same thing and even went further in some regards. Leroy Garrett said the implications of all this to unity and fellowship are weighty. It means that the gospel itself, not our doctrinal interpretations, is the basis of our being one in Christ and in fellowship with one another. That is, when one believes in Jesus and obeys Him in baptism, He is our brother and in the fellowship. This is oneness and this is unity. Now let me pause and say, that Leroy Garrett finally went to the point where he did not even believe one had to be baptized to be in the fellowship. Quite clearly, he even gave that up. He said, that fellowship is strengthened and made joyful by doctrine, but it is the gospel and not doctrine that determines fellowship. In doctrinal matters, there can be and will be diversity of opinion and interpretation. It was so with the apostles themselves, and I want to deny that. I don't want a single one to go away from here tonight thinking I approve of these statements. The idea that we would charge the apostles of being divided among themselves, 
When 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning of verse 10, the Apostle Paul pleaded that we all have the same mind, that we all might be one. When Jesus Christ prayed for unity in John chapter 17, this man is saying that division is fine. And he's saying that the apostles were divided. It was so with the apostles themselves. But this is good, he says, for we stretch each other's minds and help each other to grow in knowledge and in our mutual search for truth. Brethren, that's as rank as anything that you would ever want to see with regard to some concept of fellowship that will allow the church to open its doors or in the case of our illustration to put it inside the Trojan horse. Haul the horse inside the church and have fellowship with things that are sinful in their nature. In a debate called the Dabney Frost debate, the next chart, we have another illustration of the unity and diversity as is a practice and what I'm doing by reading from these illustrations. To show you clearly this is not something that is scarce, it is not something that is rare, but rather widespread in people's ideas that we may engage in sinful practices and still be right with God. Dabney in his debate with Gene Frost said, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin, quoting Romans 4 verse 8. The second argument that he made was, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Number two, one is made free from sin in baptism, Romans 6, 17. Therefore, sin is not imputed to those who are baptized. So if you're baptized into Jesus Christ, you may practice sin, and God does not charge that to your account. That's Gnosticism. That is as rank as anything it can be, and what it says is that you may put God in fellowship with darkness, and the Bible says it's not so. Clearly it's not so. In the third argument that Dabney made in that debate, the next chart shows... Argument number three, adultery is a sin, Matthew 19, verse 18. But sin is not imputed to the baptized. Therefore, sin is not imputed to adulterers who are baptized. Quite clearly, he wanted to bring divorced people into the church and still be right with God. We live in the time of many people are divorcing for every cause. And here was a man who looked at that situation and came up with a rationale whereby you could practice things condemned by Jesus. He admits that adultery is a sin. Notice that he admits that adultery is a sin. But he said sin is not imputed to the person baptized, therefore sin is not imputed to adulterers who have been baptized. And that has terrible echoes and uh, reminiscent of others who are teaching the same thing closer to home. The next chart shows of those what we call the new hermeneutic. You've heard that I'm sure a lot in the last few years. As some brethren have said, let's get rid of the old book, chapter, verse preaching. We found a new way to interpret the Bible. In the Wineskins magazine, Mike Cope said, When someone asked me, where is this leading us? I have to say, I'm not sure. Then when they ask, is it safe? I have to respond, probably not. But it's the direction God is leading us as we continue learning to trust Him. What he's saying is that you may just turn loose of the Bible. Turn loose of those things that give you book, chapter, and verse preaching. And we've learned a new hermeneutic. Well, brethren, that's not new. That's Gnosticism of 1 John chapter 1. That's the idea of somebody saying, we've learned something more than the apostles have learned. That is saying, we've learned something more than what the Bible teaches. And what we have to do is just turn loose of all that old Bible preaching and just say, well, we're going to go wherever God leads us. And many people are claiming to have Holy Spirit leading today apart from the Word of God among churches of Christ. Do we trust that writer or do we trust God? Is wineskin safe or do we trust the Bible? Is it safe to follow that? Rather than you know that it's not. Now we get to this point. We're going to get a lot closer to home, and I want to remind you of a disclaimer that I've already given. In talking about some of those brethren that I'm going to mention and the issue that is before us tonight, emphasize again the love that I feel for them and hold for them, and the respect that I have for them even while I disagree sharply with the positions that are being advocated. I have brought to your attention tonight the idea of unity and diversity among the Gnostics of John's day, I've talked to you about those of denominational people, those of the radicals of another decade in the churches of Christ. And there are those who are much nearer and dearer, who are teaching in principle the same thing. It may be espoused on a more scholarly level. It might be said more politely. But I want you to have the discernment to look at the issue and to recognize that the principle that is being taught is Gnosticism all over again. Anytime 
that I or anyone else comes up with a rationale by which I may involve sinful practices in my life and say that I'm going to incorporate that, incorporate that into my life and practice and still claim to have fellowship with God is wrong. The next chart speaks of Brother Ed Harrell in Christianity Magazine. Brother Harrell said, It is obvious that Christians sometimes disagree about spiritual instruction even in matters of considerable moral and doctrinal import. That behavior uniformly practiced <coughs> throughout the history of Christianity is, I believe, the issue addressed in Romans 14. <coughs> I want to ask you again, every one of you, to begin reading a fresh and a new Romans chapter 14 this week. Spend some time in that because you're going to hear it discussed. He says that the matters of considerable moral and doctrinal import are uh, the issues addressed in Romans 14. Romans 14 tolerates contradictory teachings and practices on important moral and doctrinal questions. When you get to Romans chapter 14 and look at verse 1, it talks about receiving brethren. When you understand that chapter 14 is talking about receiving brethren, and when it is taught by anyone that Romans chapter 14 involves contradictory moral and doctrinal questions, and that we can receive those who practice those, it is a violation of the principle of our holy God. It is a mistake to think that God can be put into a situation where He must have fellowship with us. In our neck of the woods up in North Texas, the next chart brings a sermon outline to your mind that Brother Don Patton has taught. These are statements taken directly from the sermon outline. He says that Romans 14 are the, involves problems involve sin. It talks about problems involve sin. There are two different issues. Eating meat, verse 2. Special days, verse 5. Number one, it involved religious observance, verse 6. Number two, number two was the truth about observing special days being revealed. So it's talking about revealed truth. It's talking about religious observances. And B says, will be made to stand unnecessary if already standing. And what Brother Patton is clearly saying in our private studies with him and in sermons I've heard from him, he's saying that Romans 14 involves brethren who have practiced things that are sinful, that are wrong, but that we must receive them anyway. Going to the next chart on this, he says that the weak and the strong are to be benefited by this chapter, and I would agree with that. The effort was to make for peace, verse 19, but that if it only applies to incidental issues, there is no peace, the weak still judge the strong, and continue to refuse fellowship would have no practical effect and is useless. What he's saying by that is there are no incidental issues in Romans 14, or there may be incidental issues, but also issues that pertain to sinful things. I put on the bottom of that a chart of 100 in association with this sermon. Brother Patton had a chart that's going to be shown to you in just a moment that had a hundred things listed on that chart, some sinful and some not. In the beginning of a sermon that has been transcribed, he said in that page one of that, that this chart illustrated things among which brethren have had dissension through the years. And I would say that for the most part that's true. But in the body of the sermon, as you read the sermon through, you find also that it connects very clearly Romans 14 to the chart and says that the things on the chart are those things that illustrate Romans 14 and its teaching. The next chart shows the list of 100, 100 things belonging, he says, in chapter 14. I'm not going to mention all of these, but let me notice, if you will, they're somewhat in uh, alphabetical uh, listing. He mentions abortion, bartending, brewery work, dance bands and dancing, divorce, girly magazines, square dancing, remarriage, social drinking, shorts and proms, and things of this nature. I don't know how you feel about this, but I'm telling you, when I hear a sermon like this, bells go off in my mind. And I'm telling you there's an issue here that has nothing to do with Brother Patton himself as a person, that has nothing to do with Brother Harold as a person. 
What Brother Harold said in Christianity Magazine is exactly what Brother Patton has said, except that Brother Patton illustrates it by getting down so on the level where he says these are the things that fit in Romans chapter 14. Brethren, when you begin to say that the things that are mentioned on, in, on this chart are things that illustrate the principles that taught in Romans 14, you're saying the same things that the Gnostics said in 1 John chapter 1. And I'm saying to you that you're witnessing a doctrine that is being promulgated that will change the very moral fiber of the churches of Christ of our time if it's allowed to pass. And I recognize that there are those who are saying that we have an axe to grind, that we have a party to support. That's just not true. To a man, to a man, every Christian ought to oppose this. There were those in John's day who went along with the Gnostic view. There are those today who are going to go along with this view. I'm telling you, if you want to see the fiber, the moral fiber of the church of Jesus Christ eroded, you allow this to go unchallenged. It's going to change the way we look at sin. And I cannot understand why when these things are preached that bells don't go, all, go off all over the brotherhood. I can't understand why things are not being stated. And in Christianity Magazine, when that series of articles was written by Brother Ed Harrell, the statement is made that Romans 14 involves contradictory morals and doctrine. It has not been addressed publicly by any of the associate editors of Christianity Magazine. That statement is laying there as a time bomb. Someone is going to pick up on it and go further with it. I believe Brother Don Patton has done so. But he illustrates these things and saying that these are illustrative of the things that four Romans 14 covers when it begins in verse 1, Receive ye. I'm saying that we ought to be alarmed at that sort of thing. The next chart speaks to whether or not we're misrepresenting Brother Patton. Brother Patton has said we misrepresent him. Others have said that we misrepresent him. Let the issue be addressed. From the transcript of the sermon, the, the outline represented, he said that's why we've had all of these dissensions, tens of thousands of them, much more than the hundred we had on the board a few minutes ago. The hundred referring to the chart just previous. Enough things that we have to divide over, but not as nearly as many as what we have divided over and we ought to be ashamed. And the answer to it is in the divine wisdom that we have from this chapter. It is not a misrepresentation. To say that Brother Patton is including the list of a hundred things with regard to what he wrote in that, what he preached in that sermon and how he applies it to Romans chapter 14. Notice again, he says we had the chart of a hundred on the board a few minutes ago. And the answer to it, the answer to what? To the hundred items that's listed on the board. The answer to it is the divine wisdom that we have from this chapter. And the next chart carries the same thought forward, again quoting from the same sermon. And so when we're dealing with factious individuals that destroy the unity and the enthusiasm and the souls that could be reached with such enthusiasm, when we're dealing with the public proclamation of false doctrine or when we're dealing with issues that all are necessarily involved in, then we're not dealing with the things this chapter described. He's talking about in clear distinction those things that are factious, those things that are rebellious don't fit in Romans 14. But these things in the chart do. But rather we're dealing with individual issues such as we had on the chart earlier. Now you notice that this last chart is a lot smaller than the other one. There were two charts. One chart showed ten things. One chart showed a hundred things. The ten things had to do with congregational issues. And he said congregational issues do not fit in Romans 14 because they're having to do with the collective body of Christ. But the 100 things are individual in nature and that's what Romans 14 covers. Notice again, now you notice on that last chart that the last chart is a lot smaller than the other one. There aren't that many congregational issues. There are a lot more than we'd like for there to be. But they're exactly, notice now, 10 times as many as on the first chart as on the one we looked at. And I think that really understates the relationship. There are many more individual issues over which brethren fall out regarding, and these are the things discussed in this chapter 
for which there is no excuse when we have dissension and falling out among brethren regarding instructions. He said, if you call those things in the chart, these things that we ought not fall out about. These are the things discussed in the Romans chapter 14. These are the things there is no excuse for dissension and falling out. On their, notice at the bottom of the note, there are two charts again. One congregational that does not fit Romans 14. The other is individual that fits that chapter. Individual issues are discussed in this chapter. Individual issues as on the chart earlier. Go back again to the next chart, or the next chart forward. If fellowship permits matters of considerable moral and doctrinal import, and contradictory teachings and practices on important moral and doctrinal questions. You think about that. If fellowship permits these things, where then can fellowship be limited on institutionalism? Where can fellowship be listed, limited on homosexuality, on profanity, on pornography, on social drinking, on abortion, on evolution, on premillennialism, on instrumental music, and finally on baptism? I'm saying to you the issue is a principle. The principle is whether or not the Word of God wraps its arms around and incorporates sinful practices so that brethren must receive those practicing those sinful things. From the beginning of the church, there were those who said, yes, we can practice sinful things and still be right with God. We saw that in John says, these are the Antichrist. We're seeing in denominations those who teach the same things. And now there are those who are saying that among us. The next chart has a quotation from Brother J.W. McGarvey. Brother McGarvey said this to Brother Sewell Hall in 1950, but the statement was made in 1902 and 1903. He said to Brother Jesse Sewell, you're on the right road. Whatever you do, don't let anybody persuade you that you can successfully combat error by fellowshipping it and going along with it. I have tried. I believed at the start that the only way to do it I've never held membership in a congregation that used instrumental music. I have, however, accepted invitations to preach without distinction between churches that used it and churches that didn't. I've gone along with papers and magazines and things of that sort. During these years, I have taught the truth as the New Testament teaches it to every young preacher who's passed through the College of the Bible. Yet I do not know of more than six of those men who are preaching the truth today, it won't work. Now I want to say to you that that's a pragmatic statement. What, uh, what Brother McGarvey learned by experience, we know because the Word of God tells us. Brother McGarvey says, I've tried this. I've tried to ride the fence. I've tried to go along and I've tried to get along. I preached in places where evil practices, sinful practices, uh, wrong doctrinal things were being done. And I've learned it won't work. Well, brethren, I want to ask you, do we have to learn to our sad experience by engaging in sinful practices that it won't work? Or is there not a better way? Isn't the better way to learn from a principle of truth that we serve a holy God and that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all, and there is no rationale, there is no principle by which I can somehow arrange it where some passage of the Bible or some aspect of God's character is going to say, I can practice sinful things and still be right with God. Let us learn it by truth and not by sad experience. Brother McGarvey had to learn by sad experience that you cannot fellowship error. Let us learn it because the Bible declares it, not because we try it out for size. In Brother Patton's sermon, the next chart shows that he believes we are commanded, not a matter of suggestion, but commanded to receive those who practice these things. He said in his sermon, notice the commands, not suggestions, not advice, but the commands given regarding these issues. Which issues? Those issues on the chart? What commands out of Romans 14? Don't tell me that sermon did not tie to Romans chapter 14. Some are not reading carefully. Some are not listening carefully. Very clearly this sermon ties that list to Romans chapter 14. But I want to say to you that if that chart never had been written, if that chart had never been put together, 
Any time that you put together a principle that says that Romans 14 includes contradictory morals and doctrine, you have the practical effects of that whether you make a list or whether you don't. The principle is the same. Notice the commands, not suggestions, not advice, but the commands that are given regarding these issues. The scruples, the individual conscientious decisions made among brethren. Some wrong. Notice that, underline it in your mind. Some wrong, some incidental, but differences that we have over such matters. He commands in verse 1, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, yet not for decisions of scruples. Look at the next chart. Does the word receive mean fellowship or not? He's made a play on whether or not receive in Romans 14 means fellowship or not. In Galatians 2 verse 5, and it should be verse 9 by the way, he talks to those who gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. I think that's the idea involved in the word receive. No second class brethren concept to be allowed under these circumstances. Brother Patton is saying the word receive in Romans chapter 14 says to have fellowship and the things illustrated on that chart. Now, the next one raises the question, does Romans 14 include adulterous marriages? Is adultery equated to the covering question? Quoting again from the same sermon, the same transcript, historically there have been too many positions to count regarding marriage, divorce and remarriage. But I don't know how you would find any issue that was more personal, that's more of an individual nature, where other Christians would not be directly involved. Now if anything is of an individual nature, like the covering question, or the carnal warfare question, it would be the personal convictions regarding divorce and remarriage. Is that soaking into you at all? I'm saying bells ought to be ringing. I'm saying that what is being taught is something that is reminiscent of the Gnosticism itself of the first century. It's saying that we can involve ourselves in sinful practices, engage in those things, and receive those into the church. Now I have some very strong convictions about what the Bible says. But I know there's some conscientious brethren that differ with me and I think they're wrong. And I welcome the opportunity to sit down and study with them, but I do it and what was said there was unclear. Because I don't have to divide over that like I would if I was worshiping with brethren who wanted to take my money and spend it for someone scripturally. I don't have to divide over divorce, marriage, and remarriage is what he's saying. And I believe the command is to receive. Do not set it not. Do not judge over such matters. And when we do, we are violating the plain commands of the Word of God and creating dissension where it ought not to be, where God forbids it. He is saying that when we say that we're not going to receive those in adulterous marriages, that we are creating dissension. That we are creating something where God forbids it. And the guilt therefore lies upon the faithful brethren who are saying adulterous marriages have no place among us. Enough times where it's required without getting over into an area where he forbids it and adding to the problem. And some will say, well there are adulterers and if there are adulterers who willfully, knowingly commit adultery, then they ought to be treated just like that brother in 1 Corinthians 5. But most often that's not the issue. The question is, is it? Neither brother would commit adultery if they believed that's what's involved. Is it adultery? Well, does that not put a premium on ignorance? If you're going to have somebody come in and they're living with their fourth or fifth wife and they're not sure it's adultery, just don't teach them. Leave them alone and receive them. If they knew it's adultery, you see, they might go to hell. If it is adultery, clearly we might have to discipline them. But Brother Patton wouldn't. I'll show that's more. He said that's a different issue about which brethren have differed. I wish they didn't, but they do. And we should try to teach them, but this chapter is about how you treat them while you're trying to teach them. Not whether they're right or whether they're wrong, but how you treat them while you're trying to teach them and while you're trying to come to the harmony that ideally exists among brethren. Now when we understand that some are babes in Christ, and some are middle-aged, and some are mature, 
We expect there's going to be differences, and the ones who do not expect that are just looking, are not looking realistically at the circumstances described in the New Testament. Babes in Christ. Now I want you to hold this thought. Babes in Christ. Those who are weak, described here in Romans 14, didn't understand what the others understood. They were living in divorce. They didn't know it. And they were wrong on about some things. About things concerning which God had revealed the truth, and they didn't understand it yet. And it takes time to grow and learn, and babies fall down, and they stumble, and they act like babies. And just be realistic about it. That's the way it is. That's not unusual. How do you treat them? Well, as long as you have this situation, when you're not involved in the sin, where you have a conscientious brother, then the command is, don't you dare set him at naught. You receive him. And when you refuse to do that, you're going to be lost yourself. When the guilt is put upon those who stand for the truth, I find it difficult to swallow. And here's someone saying that you receive this brother. He doesn't just really know about this matter because he may be a babe in Christ. Well, let's look at the next chart about this babe in Christ. I recognize the Bible describes babes and middle-aged Christians and mature Christians. He says we must receive while sinners are babes because babies make mistakes. Is W. L. Horton a babe? Is Jerry Bassett a babe? Is Homer Haley a babe? They're mature Christians. Many would say they have as much knowledge, perhaps more knowledge than most of us have forgotten. And that they all, all maintain a sinful doctrine about divorce and remarriage. Every one of these brethren would, would say, I'm honest. Every one of them would say, I'm conscientious about it. And Brother Patton would have to say, well, you have to receive them because they're honest, because they're teaching this, but not because they're babes. Can a sinner be mature and still practice error while receiving? Now let that sink in and think about the consequences of this. Can a sinner be mature and still practice error when we receive him? How many of us who are preachers in this audience have had to deal with mature Christians? who say, so long as I drink at home, I'm not doing anything wrong. Oh, I'm honest in this, and I'm conscientious in this, and don't, if you draw the line against me, and if you cause dissension, then you're sinning because you ought to receive me in this. What about an idolater? In a lesson not long ago, Brother Patton was talking about this and had a question and answer period, and one of the brethren raised the question. What about a Catholic who's a new convert, came out of the Catholic Church, but still has a holdover about worshiping idols at home. And Brother Patton said that that person could continue worshiping idols at home if they didn't make an issue of it, and they were conscientious about it, receive them, that would, he believes it's wrong. Don't misunderstand me, he believes it's wrong. But we are obligated to receive them in that practice. But what about a brewery worker? The Woodmont Church in Fort Worth where I preach, we had a young man come to us Say, Brother Roberts, I want to be a member of the Woodmont Church. I'm a member of the church. I've been attending here. I like what you're doing. I'd like to place membership with you. But he said, up front, I want you to understand I drive a brewery truck from Miller Brewery. Will that be a problem to you? I said, yeah, that'd be a problem to me. We need to study about that. He said, I don't want to study. I don't want to study. My mind is fully assured. My mind is convinced it's okay for me to do that. I can do that and be a Christian. I want to know, can I come and be a member of this congregation while I continue to do that? I called a meeting of the men. We didn't have elders at that point. I called a meeting of the men and asked them what they thought. And to a man, every one of them said, he cannot be a part of this congregation while he's driving a brewery truck. Now, I want to tell you, under Brother Patton's guidelines, we are sinning because we didn't, re we didn't receive him. And if we had received this brother... We understand that he's honest, he's conscientious. I cannot keep him from stating his views, Brother Patton says. Therefore, it's conceivable that this man could come into the church wearing his Miller Brewery patch on a shirt. The teenagers could see him down at 7-Eleven delivering his brew. He might get up and make announcements with his brewery shirt on, but we've got to receive him. Now, Brother Patton would say that's sinful, that's wrong, and you ought to teach him that it is wrong, and you teach him that he might go to hell. 
by doing this, but you still have to receive Him. And I'm not misrepresenting anybody. The next chart shows what I'm talking about. Brother Patton's receive is open-ended fellowship with error. Receive in a sinful doctrine or practice. If someone is sincere and they're fully assured in their own mind, allow them to state their convictions, but do not set it naught, do not judge them. And he says in Romans 14 with these matters, there are no time limits. There are no time limits. This is an open-ended rationale. I'm not talking about studying with someone and finally drawing the line. He says there are no time limits. Continue to receive and that those who divide over these things are themselves sinful. Now I want you to notice, I understand the distinction between this and being long-suffering. I believe in practicing long-suffering and being long-suffering with those who may be practicing sinful things. Babes must be given time to study. But when they are fully assured in their mind but still sinful, brethren, we have to apply Ephesians 5.11. We have no fellowship but reprove those who practice works of darkness. That's what the Bible says. And there's a time when we draw the line. Brother Patton says there is no time limit in Romans 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 says, Come out from among them. Brother Patton says, Bring them in among you and let them practice that. In our discussions, the next chart shows the rules that Brother Patton has suggested apply in Romans 14. These are his arbitrary rules. First of all, he says that those of Romans 14 include just brothers, not aliens. And I would agree with that. Talking about just brethren. Not talking about conscientious aliens, those who are not Christians. Talking about those who are conscientious and sincere. And he's talking about individuals and not congregations. Now that was the first time we studied. After that he changed the rules and added two more. He says that there are no moral issues under discussion in Romans 14. And the reason why he believes that is because he believes in Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, where Paul says that God had written on the hearts of the Gentiles that they, what they did, they, they did because God had written on their heart what the Jews practiced by law. He believes that God put on their heart innately. They know because God put it there that moral issues are wrong. Therefore, anytime you practice something immoral, you can't be honest and conscientious. Now think about that and I'll come back to it in a moment. If God has written that in their heart, they cannot be conscientious and honest and practice an immoral thing. Therefore, he says that uh, immoral practices do not belong in Romans 14. But I want you to understand that's Don Patton's own particular view of Romans 2. That's not widely held. And most brethren will not agree with that. Therefore, they will put moral issues in Romans chapter 14. Furthermore, he says that the brother who's going to practice these things cannot promote these things. But he also said he could state his convictions. Well, how many times can you state your conviction before you're promoting something? Can I teach a class? Is that promoting something? Can I have a private Bible study in my home? Is that promotion or is that stating my convictions? And there's a nebulous area here that, again, continues to have an open-ended rationale with, with accepting these immoral issues. The next chart talks again about Romans 14 and moral issues. Don says Mar Romans 14 does not include moral issues because of Romans 2, 14 and 15 are the innate knowledge of morals which violates conscience making honesty impossible in immorality. But if that's so, I want you to explain to me the practice of polygamy in the Old Testament and today. There was no violation of conscience when people in the Old Testament practiced polygamy. And gospel preachers who've been in foreign nations in our time have met people who practice polygamy and they don't violate their conscience because they think it's all right. Thus, the whole concept of Romans 2, verse 14 and 15 is an improper view of what that passage is saying. And I want to ask the question, is polygamy sinful? If so, if this Romans 2, 14 and 15 is true, Explain adulterous marriages as a common and accepted practice around the world. Many people practice adultery who do not have an inborn, innate sense that they're violating the will of God. Let me talk a little bit more about this in the next chart. 
We've uncovered a bucket of worms here with this Romans 2 argument. Brother Patton says, man has an innate knowledge of immorality and cannot have honesty in immorality. I want to ask then, how did he get this innate knowledge? Where does anybody get an innate knowledge of what's right and wrong? Is it outside the written word? Hebrews 8 and verse 10 and chapter 10 and verse 16 speaks of the new covenant. How under the Old Testament, how the law was written, but the new covenant is going to be written on hearts. I want to ask you, how did God write His covenant on our hearts? Was it not by the word which was declared through the apostles? Look at Colossians chapter 3 again, verse 16. Just notice what a simple truth it is and how it applies in this business of whether or not truth can be written on someone's hearts apart from the knowledge of the Word of God. In Colossians 3 verse 16, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Brethren, I cannot know any truth any will of God apart from the expressed will of God. Someone said, I think Brother Robert Farish, a few years back, caught my attention. He said, God impresses His will into animals. We call that instinct. God impresses His will into animals. But listen to it. God always expresses His will to man. And that's the truth about the matter. There has never been an innate sense of right and wrong. Yes, I can tell the difference between right and wrong. God gave the ability to know that there is a right and a wrong. But the only way that I know what is right and what is wrong is by the express will of God. And when somebody begins to say there's an innate sense by which I know right from wrong, Romans chapter 7 verse 7 says, I would not have known sin except through the law. So I raise the question, how does God write laws on the hearts? It's through the Word. And when you receive the Word, God writes it on your heart. But it's because the Word has been expressed. I want to ask again, what is this moral law? I hear a lot among brethren today about this moral law. I have yet to hear a definition. Has anybody heard a definition of moral law as opposed to positive law? What is this moral law? Is it different from revealed law? I'm saying this is a bucket of worms. Somebody again say, well, now, I know that you disagree about this, but after all, there's a moral law out here somewhere. I want to know where it is. I want to know how I understand about it. I want to know what it is. Give me a definition of what this moral law is that's something different from God's written law, God's written will. And I want to know if Patton's law, by the Patton's law, moral law is the same as Brother Haley's. Brother Haley's written a, law about this, a lot about this moral law. And because he's written about this moral law, we're supposed to understand that it exists. I want to know where it is and what it is. My understanding of the will of God is that all law came to a close at the cross except the law of Christ. If there's another law at play in the world anywhere under which we're bound today, I want to know about it. If it's different from the law of Christ, I don't know of it. But I hear a lot about a moral law that's something different from the written law. The next one talks about this word receive in Romans 14. We need to understand what that word is and how it's used. It's used by vine saying, and it denotes take to oneself or to receive, always in the middle voice, signifying a special interest on the part of the receiver, suggesting a welcome. Romans 14 verse 1 says, receive ye. Here's the word and how it's used. I want you to notice how it's used, the same word. Used in Romans 15 and verse 7. And notice what it means when it talks about receiving in Romans 15 and verse 7. Scripture explains Scripture. Verse 7 says, Therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Does that mean, therefore, fellowship? We are to receive as Christ received us. Look at the next chart, which is a statement about Thayer. Thayer says of the same word, to receive to grant one access to one's heart, to take into friendship and intercourse. Again, used in the same scriptures. Notice what he says. God and Christ are said to have received those whom formerly estranged from them, they have reunited to themselves by the blessing of the gospel. That says fellowship. And Brother Patton said earlier, Galatians chapter 2 verse 9, 
that when he talked about receiving them, they received them in the right hand of fellowship. So that's what the word means. Receive in Romans 14 includes fellowship. The next chart is a chart that discusses what it means to receive. Brother Patton says, receive them in these matters, though they may be fallen, though they may living, be living in sin, though they may be practicing some things, that they are to be received in this because God is able later to make them stand. And he uses John 7, 17 as possibly by the teaching of the Word and Bible study later on that God will make them stand. But I want you to notice that's a misuse of that. What God is saying with regard to receiving brethren in Romans 14, verse 3 says, God hath received them, and that's past tense, it means God received them in the past. Then in verse 3 and verse 4, it's our verse 4, to his own master he stands or falls. That's present tense. And finally in verse 4, God is able to make him stand, that's future tense. God has received this brother in Romans 14. God is able to make him stand, or to his own master he stands or falls, present tense. And God is able to make him stand in what? In sinful practices? No. In the practice of meats and herbs or days, since neither was sinful. And I want to stop right here and say, we need to look again at the context and the text of Romans 14 and understand that there are not sinful practices under consideration in Romans 14. I want to drive that home before I get through. The practices of herbs or days was not sinful in Romans 14. God does not accept sin, 1 John 1, 5, but He receives the brethren in Romans 14. Do not judge them, He said in verse 10, as sinful. The next chart puts it in perspective. Any attempt to put sinful doctrine or practices in Romans 14, first of all, violates the context. There's nothing in that passage that says that sinful practices are under consideration. It also, if there are sinful practices in Romans 14, puts God in fellowship with sin, because Romans chapter 4 or 14 says God hath received him. If there are sinful practices in Romans 14 and God hath received him, that's in violation of God's nature, 1 John chapter 1. Furthermore, if there are sinful practices in Romans chapter 14, it brings sin right into the church. Because John says, or uh, uh, Romans 14, Paul says, receive them and provides a basis for open-ended fellowship with sin. I would like for you to remember this chart if you don't remember any others. When you read Romans 14, I want you to understand there's not a sinful practice or doctrine being taught in Romans 14. God's law, Romans 14, the next chart, shows now what Romans 14 teaches. Romans 14 is God's plan for unity in matters of judgment. Churches have been torn asunder by opinions and arguments over matters of judgment. And God in His grace has provided a chapter that tells us how we can get along. How we can continue in fellowship without dividing over these issues, without splintering over these things. Brethren in the Restoration Movement understood this. They said in matters of faith, unity. In matters of judgment, or opinion, liberty, and all things charity. Tolerance and forbearance with for brethren who differ with one another in matters of indifference to God is what Romans 14 is talking about. Not talking about tolerance for sin, brethren. It's not talking about tolerance for sin. Paul said in Galatians 2, we gave place no, not for an hour, about sinful practices. But in Romans 14, Paul says, receive ye. So then, if you look at the next chart, we're talking about the distinction between matters of faith and matters of indifference. Matters of faith are determined by direct commands, approved apostolic examples, and by divine implications and necessary inferences. How many times have you heard that? That's how we determine matters of faith, matters of the faith. Matters of indifference are those beliefs or practices which are not specifically regulated by Scripture. They're neither commanded nor forbidden. And I've used as an illustration all the way through the Lord's Supper. We have a direct command in Matthew 26 about the Lord's Supper. This do. We have the approved apostolic example of Acts 20 verse 7 where Paul was present when the Lord's Supper was taken. 
We have the divine implication in Acts 20 verse 7 that only on the first day of the week do we practice that. But what hour of the day must we practice the Lord's Supper? That's not stated. It is a matter of indifference to God so long as it's the Lord's day. And how many containers do we have on from the Lord's table? That's a matter of indifference to God so long as we accurately understand the Lord's Supper. There are some things that are commanded and some things that are indifferent to God. Look at the next chart that I hope clarifies it anymore. When we're talking about matters of indifference, we need to understand categories of actions in the Bible. There are those things that are commanded. We have no choice in these matters. Only one right way to act. We must do them to adhere to God's pattern. But there are some things forbidden. We have no choice in these things. Only one right way to act in these things that are forbidden. We must not do them to adhere to God's pattern. There's a third category of things that are allowed. We have a choice in these matters. There's a plurality of right actions. We may do them or may not do them without inherent sin. It depends on the situation and the personal conscience which is found in Romans 14. I maintain that what's found in Romans 14 are matters of indifference. Things that are neither right nor wrong in themselves. Now let's look at the next chart that describes very clearly what Romans 14 is all about. Matters of indifference. Those things that are discussed and illustrated in matters of indifference in Romans 14, first of all, are meats. Some who would eat meats and some who would not. Notice I know that the only revelation that God has said about this is in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 8 that food does not commend us to God. We're neither the better if we eat nor worse if we don't. Therefore, food in the light of Matthew, or rather Romans 14, is a matter of indifference to God. It is not bound. It is not God's law with regard to this. God doesn't care of whether you eat meats or whether you do not eat meats. It's your choice. The days is the second illustration there. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16, said, Let no man judge you in respect of food or drink. Our festivals, our new moons, or Sabbaths. Days are not bound by God under the new law. The faith and practice of both meats and days, in Romans 14, are good, the text says. The text says they are clean, and the text says they are to be received. They're not commanded things, that is required. They're not forbidden things, therefore sinful, but they are allowed. That's the context of Romans 14. When you read tonight and tomorrow, and the next day, when you read forever after, Romans 14, establish clearly in your minds the context. The context of Romans 14 is how brethren get along in matters of indifference to God. We are not condemned to splinter over every issue. We're not condemned to divide and have dissension over every issue that comes down the pike. But rather there is within the grace of God a chapter of the Bible, His inspired word that tells us that we may differ in some things and still be brethren. And the practical effect of that is that we may learn and continue in fellowship while, and while we disagree about some matters. Another chart that is not mine, and some of these are not my charts, Romans 14 deals with matters of indifference. Again, notice the context of chapter 14. The herb eater was weak in faith, not sinful. He was equally right to eat or not eat meat. He was sinful to condemn the meat eater. That's the sin in that passage. One could eat or not eat to the Lord. Here's a brother who said, I believe I should not eat because it may be meat sacrificed or not. I'm not going to eat because I love the Lord. He did that. Another brother said, I'm going to eat the meat because God made meat to be received with thanksgiving and I'm going to eat this to the Lord. The meat eater could eat to the Lord. The non-meat eater could not eat to the Lord. Eating meat was clean. Eating meat was good. Meat eating was included in the category of all things being pure. God received the meat eater. The meat eater was made to stand, not fall, and one could eat meat so long as he did not cause the weak to stumble. Now then, let me just switch horses with you. Let's put something in the next chart. It's a matter of sin. Does this go in Romans 14? We're talking about sinful things in Romans 14. Does this fit? Does modern dancing fit Romans 14? We're told that it does on our chart of a hundred things. Is man who engages in modern dancing weak in the faith or sinful? Is it equally right to dance or not dance? Is it sinful to condemn the man who participates in dancing? We're told that you, if you divide over some of these issues, you sin and you'll be lost because you divided over these sinful practices. Can one engage in the movements of modern dances to the Lord? Is dirty dancing described as being clean? 
That's what Romans 14 says about what the context of Romans 14 is. Is the Lombada good? Or are the movements of modern dancing in the category of all things being pure? Does God receive the dancers? Now, here's what it's all about. Does God receive the dancers? Are you condemned when you say as brethren, we don't want dancing among our people because it's immoral. And when you say you shouldn't do that, then you say you shouldn't judge and if you judge you're going to be lost. Can one engage in dancing without being an occasion of stumbling to the weak? But let's go look at it again. What about immodest clothing? Is a man who wears immodest clothing weak in faith or sinful? Is it equally right to wear immodest or modest clothing? Is it sinful to condemn the one who wears immodest clothing? Can one be immodest to the Lord? You see, this is what Romans 14 is saying about can we do these things? I know that I can do these things to the Lord if the matters of indifference. Can I do them if the matters of sinful practices? Is wearing immodest clothing good and clean? Is immodesty among those things included as being pure? Does God receive the immodest wearer? Does the immodest one stand? Can one wear immodest apparel and not be an occasion of stumbling to the weak? And now then, the next chart, let's get more to the issue of the day. Does Romans 14 include adulterous marriages? That's what this is all about with some brethren. Is a man who commits adultery this weak in faith or sinful? Is it equally right to commit or not commit adultery? Is it sinful to condemn the man who commits adultery? What we have seen in the sermon by Brother Patton is that you must receive those who engage in adulterous marriages and that you are condemned if you draw the line against them. God may send you to hell because you failed to receive them. Can one commit adultery to the Lord? Is adultery clean and good? Is adultery among those things included in all things being pure? Does God receive the adulterer? That's the question of our day. Does God receive the adulterer? And we're hearing it said again and again, yes, we must receive the adulterer. Does the adulterer stand or fall before God? Can one commit adultery as long as he's not an occasion of stumbling to the weak? The next chart reminds us again what we're talking about. Does Romans 14 discuss revealed truth? The faith? What's revealed about the issues of meets and days? That God is indifferent to them. Not that they're matters of the faith. They're not matters of commandment. They're not matters that are forbidden. God has not made them a test of fellowship or of the faith. Again, meats, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 8. You're neither the better nor the worse if you eat. Could you say that about adultery? Could you say that about dancing? Could you say that about immodest apparel? You're neither the better nor the worse if you practice this. Meats and days are not bound, Colossians 2 verse 16. One's subjective emotions do not make a matter of indifference into a matter of faith. This statement addresses what some people says, but now look in Romans 14. That weak brother felt very strongly about this. And this weak brother, he believed that to be a matter of the faith. But one's subjective emotions about a thing does not make it a matter of the faith if it is not a matter of the faith. God labeled eats, eating meats and the practice of days as a matter of indifference to him. And though some brother may have felt very strongly about that, he needed to be taught because he was binding where God did not bind. The word doubtful disputations is used in Romans 14. They're not matters of the faith, for God has not left the faith in doubt. This whole thing makes the faith very nebulous, but God has not left the faith in doubt. Ephesians 3 verse 4 here says, Hereby when you read, you can perceive my understanding in the mystery of Christ. Paul says you can know what the faith is all about. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we understand that God has written all these things that a man might be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21 and many other passages, the Bible tells us clearly that I may understand what truth is that has been revealed by the Holy Spirit. One's mistaken concept of what is included in the faith does not change a matter of indifference into the faith. Doubtful disputations were matters of personal belief that were arrived at without revelation from God. They were opinions and judgments, strongly held personal beliefs, and in themselves, doubtful disputations are not sinful. Look at the next one that talks about the context of these doubtful disputations. They were beliefs and practices and brethren that God accepts. 
These things that were doubtful disputations were beliefs and practices and brethren that God accepts. They were done to the Lord, verse 6. We must not judge them to be sinful, verse 10. They are pronounced not unclean, in verse 14, and they are pronounced pure, in verse 20. The only sin of this passage is that of judging a brother or a practice sinful or eating while in doubt offending the conscience. Let's look at these weak and strong brethren in the next chart. What are the weak brethren and the strong brethren? A strong brother is informed in the Word of God. He is able to practice eating meats or days. He has right understanding. He's doing it to the Lord. He's convinced in his own mind and give God thanks. The only danger to this strong brother was if he causes the weak to stumble or sets the brother at naught, and Paul warns him against that. But the practice was not sinful. The weak brother was an uninformed brother. He was unable to practice eating meats or observing days. He had poor understanding. He didn't understand the principle of 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 8, Colossians 2.16. He was doing it not to the Lord. He refused to do it because of his faith in the Lord. He was convinced in his own mind. And he gives God thanks for his practice. His danger was that he judged his brother or violated his own conscience by doing what he believed was wrong. The next chart says, well, what sins could make one fall in Romans 14? I believe that some brother could fall. And the Bible describes this. Neither the weak or the strong brother sinned in faith and practice. I'm underlining that again. God received him, verse 3, unless, and I'm repeating what I just said for emphasis, unless the weak brother judged the strong as sinful, or the strong brother caused the weak to stumble, or his own conscience was violating by eating with doubt. If he did those things, he might sin, but the practice of eating meats or not eating. Or the practice of observing days are not observing days. Laws not sinful. And when someone uses those to illustrate that we may bring sinful practices in Romans 14, they're simply not teaching the truth. So then let's look at truth in the next chart. Does truth conflict? <coughs> receive, do not receive. We've got the phrase in, first, in Romans 14 to receive one another. Verse 1, receive one who is weak. But then the Bible also says, do not receive. Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, Ephesians 5 and verse 11. Do not go beyond the doctrine of Christ, 2 John 9. Those who play sinful brethren and practices in Romans 14 makes truth seem ridiculous. Because in Romans 14 we're told we have to receive whoever is in Romans 14, whatever they practice, but we're told in Ephesians 5 in the verse 11 and 2 John 9, 9 uh, through 11 that we're not to receive and so we're caught in a dilemma. Somebody says in Romans 14, receive these sinful practices. But Ephesians 5 says don't receive these sinful practices. Now, what are we to do? Truth seems ridiculous with this understanding and we know that truth is not ridiculous. The next chart talks about the conflict that we have with these matters. The Bible says contend for the faith, once for all deliver to the saints. But the Bible says in Romans 14, don't contend. Now what am I to do? I'm caught in a conflict if Romans 14 is about sinful things. Romans 14 talks about doubtful disputations, judging and discerning. And I'm not to contend, I'm not to discern about those things in Romans chapter 14. Therefore I can draw a conclusion. If I'm to contend for the faith, but I'm not to contend for those matters in Romans 14. I know that Romans 14 does not contain matters of the faith. But that's just the truth about the matter. Look at the next one. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11 says, Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Are these works of darkness, abortion, bartending, reading girly magazines, evolution, Divorce and remarriage, those are some of the things on the chart. God says reprove them. Brother Patton says receive them. Again, let's go back to the limitations of Romans 14. The early rules by Brother Patton. Brother Patton said early in our study, he must be a brother, not an alien. He must be honest and sincere. He must be an individual and not a congregation matter. 
Then he says later it must exclude moral issues, but his rationale for that is Romans 2, 14, which few brethren believe and practice, therefore for all intents and purposes, that's an empty restriction, and most people will practice Romans 14 on moral issues. He said we must exclude promotion of error, but it says at the same time we may state our convictions. So it's going to be a matter of subjection as to whether or not we do that. But let's try these limitations on for size. Brother Patton's limitations in Romans 14 with regard to idolatry. If a man who's a Catholic comes out of the Catholic Church still holding to his views of his idols on the wall at home and he bows down and worships his idols, Brother Patton has said specifically with regard to that issue in our study that we are to receive one who worships idols. What about polygamy? Romans 2 verse 14, he says he's going to have an innate knowledge that that's sinful, not according to those who have practiced polygamy. They believe they have a right to do that. What about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? We have individuals who are practicing that, and some are doing so, they believe, sincerely. We therefore must receive them. What about the brewery work? I mentioned that a moment ago. And what about the dance band? We had a member of the church at Woodmont, already a member, that we found out after a period of time he was playing in a dance band. We talked with this brother about that and he said, my conscience is clear. I think I can play in a dance band without any problems. I take my wife with me when we go into the dance halls and I play for the dance halls. And you have to understand Fort Worth territory to understand that he was playing in dance bands on the Jacksboro Highway. Well, those are just dives. If you know anything about Fort Worth and the Jacksboro Highway, and he was saying, I can take my wife and I can go into the Jacksboro Highway dives and I can play in a dance band and be right with God. We withdrew from him. Brother Patton's rules say we have to receive him. His rules say that if we re if refuse to receive him, we sin and we may go to hell because we withdrew from him. I'm telling you that this rationale for open-ended fellowship with sinful practices will destroy the moral fiber of Christians and churches if allowed to hold sway. Each brother, each is a brother, each is sincere, each is fully assured in his own mind, agrees not to be factious, will not involve, involve the whole congregation. His rules demand that we receive them. I've had a lot of discussion with brethren who drink. I've gotten into some very tight situations with brethren who drink. And they tell me that I can drink at home, privacy of my own home. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm fully assured in my own mind that I can do that. And according to Brother Patton's rules, we have to allow him to do it. And if I make a dissension about it, I commit a sin. And if I judge him and withdraw from him, I may go to hell because I've done so. I'm afraid of what these rules allow. The next chart simply says, please don't be misled. The issue is not meets and days. That's not our problem. The issue is not whether or not to be long-suffering. I understand the Bible principles expressed in Ephesians 4 and other places about being long-suffering and study with people. It's not about brotherhood watchdogs. I ask you to hear Brother Jerry Fight. Fine lesson on watchdogs. Because many of us who are preaching sermons like this are being called brotherhood watchdogs. I think there's something worse than a watchdog. I think it's a dumb dog that won't bark. And Isaiah talks about that. And whenever brethren refuse to speak out against sinful practices that are being brought within the church, and said so we have to receive them, and if we have dissension about the matter, we sin because we won't receive them. There's something wrong in Israel, my brethren. It's not about brotherhood watchdogs. It's not about lining everybody up with a party. How many times has that excuse floated? I heard it all through the institutional problem. I've heard it about every time anybody comes up with a sinful practice and they fight against it. Somebody says, oh, you're just trying to line everybody up with a party. And that is being said again and again about me and about other brethren. 
that you're just trying to line people up with the party. I'm trying to look at the issue of truth. The only thing I'm interested in tonight is what the Bible teaches about fellowship with God. The most precious thing that is our possession is our fellowship with Almighty God. And if I act in such a way to violate the character of God, I'm going to lose that fellowship. And I dare not. It's not about church autonomy. It's not about whether or not we can tell churches what they ought to do and make churches violate their autonomy. It's not it at all. But neither is it about whether or not a church has the autonomy to override God's law either. Churches are not arbiters of truth. God's law must prevail whether the church wants it or not. And it's not just a preacher fuss. The men that I've mentioned, I won't emphasize again, I love dearly. I have no animosity about these brethren. I, I hope and pray that through study and through study of God's Word and lessons like this and studies like this, we may go past the point of division and all agree upon God's Word. We need to understand that that's the case. It's not a witch hunt. We're trying to mark and brand people. It's about what is an issue of truth. It concerns, in many cases, whether or not people can marry and divorce for every cause and still be right with God. That's what the issue finally comes down to. The next chart says, what is the interest in Romans 14? What's this fuss all about? It's going to center to a large degree. Some who advocate divorce for every cause are looking for a loophole. They've tried to redefine adultery. You remember the argument? It's not really adultery. It's not sexual. It's just a covenantal thing. They redefined adultery. They've tried to put it under moral law, whatever that is. They've tried to put it under the part, 1 Corinthians 7, 15. They've tried to put it under grace, the Dabney Frost debate. They've tried to put it under local church autonomy, let the local church decide whether or not we're going to receive adulterers. They've tried to put it under necessity. God wants everybody to have a wife, 1 Corinthians 7, 1. They have been unsuccessful in all those attempts. Now they're trying, Romans 14, this Trojan horse. We're going to put all these issues in the belly of this beast and bring it into the church. So that the church has all these issues in it. Just like the bold weevil, they're looking for a home. They think they found it, Romans 14, but they haven't. I want to ask you, are you ready for divorce to increase? And I don't want to insult my California brethren, but I want to ask you, are you ready for California living to come to Texas? In Colorado one time I saw a bumper sticker that said, Don't Californicate Colorado. <laughs> are we ready to Californicate Texas with the doctrine that you can marry and divorce at will and still be right with God? That's what some of this is about. Are we ready to have adultery defended from the pulpit, my brethren? There are preachers who are living in adultery today and accepted by the churches. Are you ready for that? That's what it's coming down to. Are you ready to have your children, your grandchildren, Marry into adultery as a matter of fact. I have a granddaughter who's being raised in a church in the Northwest where they teach and practice adultery. When she comes of age and looks for a husband, she's not going to be concerned about how many marriages he's had before because she's being taught that adultery is a Southern view. And you can marry and divorce at will and still be right with God. And I fear for my granddaughter. And I fear for your grandchildren. And I fear for your daughters and your sons. Who, if we allow this to pass, are going to be told again and again, receive these people. Receive them. Don't be dis dissentious about it. Allow these things to go on in the churches. Are you ready to bed down with sin in the local church? If not, you need to let your voice be heard. We're not preaching these things tonight because they're joy to us or because we have glee in these matters. We're not preaching because we enjoy the, the division between brethren. I know I'm preaching tonight because I'm disturbed when I see sinful practices enter the church of my Lord. And I know that I'm disturbed when I see people say things it says, when faithful brethren stand up and say, these things shall not pass, you're labeled as an anti or worse. We need to recognize that these things won't pass. So I want to conclude tonight by saying, would you be comfortable in a congregation where these sinful practices are permitted? 
Well, would you be comfortable where it is taught that God receives those who practice these things? Would you be comfortable where brethren are urged to accept them into the fellowship? And would you be comfortable where any who draw the lines are condemned? This is the issue. That's what it's all about. I know there's going to be a lot of smoke screens, a lot of charges and counter charges. I want you to remember tonight, my main lesson to you is that some brethren are saying that we may receive sinful practices into the church, have fellowship with those who do those things, and that those who say we cannot have fellowship with them are to be labeled and driven out. And we may go to hell because we're, we're saying that you cannot fellowship sinful practices. There are doctrines in place being taught by brethren and magazines that teach these things. I urge you to read with discernment, to read with an open Bible, to look afresh at Romans 14 and decide independently what is the will of God and stand there. Stand there. Having done all to stand. If you're in the audience tonight and not a Christian, we will not close this lesson without urging you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've been talking about fellowship. I say to you again that fellowship is one of the most precious, if not the most precious thing that we have. Fellowship with God. You come into the fellowship with God when you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of every sin, and as you confess the name of Jesus Christ, be baptized for the remission of sins, and because you have been made righteous by forgiveness, therefore holy, you may be brought into a relationship with the Holy God. If you're not a Christian, you have no fellowship with God. If you are not a Christian, we invite you to enjoy that blessing. Won't you come as we stand together and sing the song that's been selected.